It's good to see you all this morning, and we're, we're uh, blessed to have those who are with us by uh, internet, by Facebook, or by YouTube later in the week as we post those. And we encourage you to click the share button so others will, your friends and family will know where you are and what is a priority in your life. It's good to see you all this morning. And uh, we met last week. Trust that everyone has recovered and, and made it through the storms okay. We had a few folks that uh, had some kinks in, in life, but uh, that's part of life, isn't it? So uh, two things just to lift up to you. We're having a um, small group study that will be both in person but also available online. And that's going to begin March the 10th on Wednesday night. If we're able to get all the resources, get everything together, March 10th, Wednesday night. Uh, called Third Option, uh, a curriculum that we, we found, uh, really good material about uh, having conversations on race in our culture and in our church today. And so that will be on uh, Wednesday night beginning March the 10th, uh, anticipate six weeks. You can join online or you can uh, come in person. It will be held in room 105 at seven o'clock on Wednesday nights. So if you're interested in that, speak to me or call the church office because we do need to have your internet, um, uh, what do you call it, email address. So we can email the uh, Zoom link to you so you can join. So we need your, your email address. We need to know that you're wanting to be a part of that conversation. And uh, the second thing we want to lift up is uh, please be in prayer for the families of, uh, family of, and friends of John Stewart. Uh, he died Friday night and uh, tragic loss and loss to the families and loss to our church. And uh, we don't have any arrangements yet for any kinds of services or anything, but please be in prayer for family and friends of Jonathan Stewart. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your word, for your people, a place where we can go and a people that we can gather with who share the hopes and the hurts of this world, the hopes that we have in you, the hurts of this world and this life and the challenges that we face. And as we turn to your word, as we come to worship you, let our hearts be turned to you, our eyes focus upon you, our thoughts upon you. As we give ourselves more fully and completely, let us step one step closer to you and know your presence in deep and real and intimate ways. Through Christ our Lord we pray and let all God's people say. Now let's join together in singing 117, O God our help in ages past. Let's continue now with What a Friend We Have in Jesus, 526.
Thank you, Gary, Kathy, and Maggie. Listen to those words again. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? And who among us do not know, does not know troubles? Is there trouble anywhere, wherever it might be? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Well, two weeks ago, we began a series, a short series in the book of Revelation, the letters to the seven churches. Jesus dictates to the apostle John short notes to seven churches as the prelude or the entry to the, to the book of Revelations. We started that with the first letter to the first church, which is the church at Ephesus. And um, the church at Ephesus was commended for their good works, but they were found to be short in one major area. They had lost their first love, or they had their love for Jesus had waned and had faded. And of the seven churches, five of the seven have, uh, Jesus is, is critical of them. He finds fault. He, he, he commends them but he finds error and finds places of correction. Two of the churches, and one of them when we look at today, Jesus only commends or only encourages. He doesn't find fault or failure and shortcomings. The church at Smyrna, and uh, well, I should say last week, Joey, uh, we started this series two weeks ago, and Joey and Patty Romero were with us last week, we had that inclement weather. We had a lot of roads that were hard to travel. I want to encourage you, if you did not complete your Faith Promise renewal card, we had those available. We have them in the foyer. You can do that today. We're going to mail them out to those who, who haven't turned them in um, and uh, encourage you to renew it and uh, prayerfully consider where you are with your Faith Promise. Faith Promise is something that we do to support ministries and missionaries beyond our four walls. There are five local ministries uh, that we support the Saird Street Shelter, Wesley Tech Wesley Foundation, the CCA, Life Choices, and uh, got to be one more. The Children's Home. Thank you, Deborah. And then we have our international missionaries that we support, uh, the Winkles, who are ministry to Chinese nationals in in Memphis. Uh, uh, as their son Micah recovers from from cancer, uh, they've served in China. They continue to minister to uh, Chinese who come here who are either family of patients who are at St. Jude and they come here pretty regularly or who are on staff at the uh, Children's Hospital there at St. Jude. And then we have the Romeros who uh, through Therefore International are serving the people of Ghana, West Africa and Kotakata, which is a very remote area out in the jungle. And we have um, Share International with uh, Sammy Marimi serving the people in uh, Turkana land, Kenya, and the Datweilers who are serving in Ecuador. So those four international missionaries um, we support as well. And we divide those funds that come from Faith Promise, and that's over and above our regular giving, over and above our, our tithes and offerings. And those funds go to those ministries, and 100% of those funds go out. So we encourage you to uh, renew that Faith Promise gift that you've uh, been so faithful with over the last years. So we come to this church at Smyrna, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure what we have up first. If we have our scripture there, Will, can we, can we pull that up? I think we do. Uh, I wanted to give a little bit of background. There may be a couple of maps there. What's our first slide? Our Wes? Let me see if we do. There it is. Oh. Let's see if we can find it. Oop. Mm, that's, yeah. Can you move on? That's, that slide shouldn't be in that presentation on Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 2. I probably copied an old PowerPoint and then I slipped that in. So we're not on Revelation 2, evidently. Well, we'll take a moment for that. I'll read the scripture from Revelation chapter 2, beginning at the 8th verse. And Jesus said, I am the Alpha and Omega. 
I'm sorry, second chapter would be helpful, wouldn't it? Okay, here we are. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions. There we are. Uh, let's see. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. If I don't come back to that, 10 days is a biblical uh, frame that's used several times. As we use in the book of Isaiah. It means a short time. To the, uh, let's see. Next slide. You will suffer persecution 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This was a circular letter that was written, the book of Revelation, and we'll look at a map in just a moment. We'll see how it traveled around Turkey, where these seven churches were, and um, and it would have been circulated so that each of those congregations could have read it. So there's benefit to each congregation, even in the letters that weren't written to them specifically. How many of you get Christmas cards that might be addressed to one member of your family and not to somebody else? Anybody ever get that? We get them sometimes. I'll, I'll get a card from a friend. Well, Evelyn reads that, or Evelyn gets a card, and she shares hers with me. So these letters were circular letters that were written with... Uh, pointedly written to these seven churches, but there's benefit for each of the churches in what is being written. Whoever has ears, so he says, uh, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. We're all going to experience the first death, physical death, unless Jesus comes. Or when Jesus comes, those people that are alive won't experience the first death. But the first death is physical death. We need not experience the second death, and that is separation from, from God. In the book of uh, Genesis, we see the curse that's put on Adam and Eve, that in the day that you eat of that fruit in the garden, the, the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die, God says. Well, they ate that fruit, but they lived physically, but they were separated. They were kicked out of the garden. They were separated. So that's the separation that you and I don't have to experience we're born again. That's the first birth. Somebody said we're, we're born twice so that we can die only once. But if we're only born once, we'll die twice. Think about that. We're born twice, Kathy. You're born again. You know Jesus. You're born again. You only die once. But if you die, if you're born once, you don't accept Christ and you don't have the second birth, you'll die twice. That's good. All right, let's go on. Oh, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your word, and as we go into your word, we pray that we would find application in our lives and that it would be for our good and for your glory. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Let all God's people say amen. I've been reading some uh, posts by a friend of mine who I went to seminary with, a classmate. He went on and got his Ph.D. in uh, philosophy. He teaches now and he travels. He, he grew up as a missionary's kid in mainland China. And he's been writing posts lately on his uh, Facebook account of martyrdom and, and martyrs in China, uh, spanning hundreds of years. But one of the stories that struck me was the story of a man named Chang. And they called him Blind Chang. He was a womanizer and an adulterer and an alcoholic, and he just lived this wasted life. And, and he lost his eyesight, and, and, and he went to, uh, to a, a city where he, was, he heard there were missionary doctors who could help him. And they gave him some relief, and for some period of time, he had some of his eyesight back. But the big benefit was that he came to Christ. And uh, when he returned to his home village, along the way, he was so excited about his new, newfound relationship with Christ that he was telling people and he was sharing with people along the way. Well, it was the late 1800s, and in 1899, there was a, a massive uprising by, you've heard of the Boxer Rebellion. Well, the Boxers were, uh, were advocates and, and adamant uh, proponents of purifying China. 
and uh, and there was a, a great bloodletting. There was a great martyrdom, and, and they 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 were pledged to kill all foreigners and and any Chinese that had uh, accepted Christianity, uh, which was considered a foreign religion. And these adherents were known as, as boxers. And, and uh, when they got near Chang's village, the Christians told Chang that the, the boxers were coming, so they hid him in a, in a cave. And then when the, when the boxers came to the village, they rounded up Christians, uh, Christian Chinese, Chinese Christians, and, and they threatened them and they said, uh, how did you find out about Christ, about Jesus? And they said, well, Chang, blind Chang told us about it. And, and they said, you can have your lives spared if you will turn him over to us. Well, when word got to Chang and he, he got uh, word that, that they were holding about 50 of his uh, friends and, and followers of Jesus, uh, he said, I will gladly surrender my life for theirs. And he came, uh, he came to town and uh, he made this, this trek to die in their place. He handed himself willingly over to these to these boxers and to the authorities who would force him to worship idols. And on the 22nd of July, 1900, when he decidedly would not renounce Christ, the boxers beheaded him. The story goes that, uh, and, and then they they burned his what was remained of his, uh, his his remains to prevent him from rising from the dead. They'd heard that Christians could rise from the dead. But the end story is that the boxers who had killed him fled in fear because of the way that they saw him die with courage and with strength and willingly come to lay down his life for his fellow believers. It's been said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The city of Smyrna, beautiful city on the Mediterranean Sea, uh, gradual slopes that lead up. And, and, and I was there several years ago, and, and from any point in the city, you can, you can see it's now uh, the city of Izmir, uh, but um, you can see the Mediterranean, beautiful green, blue uh, Mediterranean waters. And the sun goes down over the Mediterranean, it's gorgeous. Was a strategic city in in the days of the Apostle John when he was uh, exiled to the city of Patmos. And we'll see that, or to the island of Patmos. And so here's the general layout of the area. I wanted to do this. We didn't do this two weeks ago. Been wanting to do this to get some some geography to it. The seven cities or seven churches of Revelation are in red dots there, and. Uh, the Isle of Patmos is just off. Let's go to the next slide. You can see um, a little closer in, the Isle of Patmos is marked in the pinkish red background. It's just off the coast. So John was forced into exile. This is Jesus' disciple, John. And he wrote this letter as it was dictated to him by Jesus. Uh, and here's the, the circuitous trade route or the, the, the way it would have circled around the, these uh, letters. Last week we were on, or two weeks ago, we were on Ephesus, and it's still a, a major uh, attraction. It's not a major city like it was in that day and time. And then Smyrna, and then we'll go to Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia. And Philadelphia and Smyrna are the only two cities that are only commended and not criticized by Jesus. So let's go and see a little bit more about, I'm not sure what I have after this. Okay, well, that's one one view in the city of, uh, that's part of the, the uh, Agora, and you see the little trench-like area in the center. They collected rainwater, and they could funnel it off and use it in, in different places because they obviously couldn't drink the seawater in there. But there's not much left in the, in the way of ruins uh, of the city anymore. So um, the, the things that I want us to look at today that apply back to us, because the city of Smyrna was known for its suffering and its persecution. And you and I know nothing of persecution as followers of Christ, not in comparison to what they had known, nor in comparison to what people like Blind Chang or others have known. So I wanted to try to extract and to draw the truths from our scripture this morning that do apply to our lives 
And then I want to give us an opportunity to ask ourselves, how can we support those in the world today who are suffering because of their faith? So Jesus does several things with it in this very brief note to the church at Smyrna. First, he reminds them of who he is. He reminds them of who he is. He says, I am the one who died and am alive. These are words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. Now, Smyrna had about, has about a 3,000-year history. 3,000 years, 4,000 years, well, actually 3,000 B.C., so um, 5,000 years of history. So 3,000 years before the, the letter was written, uh, it, it was a thriving city and a seaport, uh, one of the principal cities on the Aegean Sea, if not on the entire Mediterranean. But they had experienced a, a seemingly endless cycle of apex and summit and, and, and life at its best and being prominent to being trashed and destroyed and burned and crushed. Uh, this, for 3,000 years, uh, they, they, they rode this roller coaster of prominence and, and, and wealth to absolute dejection and destruction. In the day that this letter would have been written, they were prominent. They were well known. They had been rebuilt. They had been destroyed several hundred years earlier. Um, when they, um, when they were rebuilt, it was in the days of, of uh, Alexander the Great, uh, around 300 B.C. So for three centuries, they had stood uh, uh, once again as a prominent city, but they had known what it was like to be crushed. And when Jesus speaks to them, he said, I am the one who died and came to life again. You see that? That he knows what it's like to be down and virtually in the eyes of the world destroyed and yet come back and be resurrected. They knew what that was like. And, and Jesus comes alongside us and he says, I know what it's like to be crushed and yet to be resurrected. He reminds them of who he is. Let me see if I can find it. Let's go on. And then he relates himself. Uh, to them as best he can. And he wants to re relate to each of us. And here's three ways that Jesus relates to them in their suffering. He, he relates to them in their affliction. I know your afflictions and your poverty. He says to the people at Sir Smyrna, to the church at Smyrna, that the city may have been thriving, but the church was being persecuted. And he says, I know what it's like to be crushed. I know what it's like. Listen to what Isaiah 53 says about Jesus and the prophecy about him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, like one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Basically, Isaiah says Jesus was, was so outcast that we wouldn't have even acknowledged him. He was coming along and he was going to come as the savior of the world, but he's going to be the suffering savior, the suffering servant. And, and he comes alongside of us, and we would not even acknowledge him. It's kind of like when we pull up to a, a, uh, an intersection, and there's someone there with the sign out, we'll work for food. What do we do? Well, I can tell you what I do. More often than not, I'm finding something else to look at. You ever been there? And that's what Isaiah says Jesus would have been like. That he was esteemed not. That he would have been there with the sign saying, here I am and I'm here to lay down my life for you. And we would have been ignoring him. Because we want to be looking to the conqueror, to the victor, to the hero. And he's not our hero when he's being crushed. And Isaiah says, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took on our infirmities and carried our sorrows. He, he relates to us in our weakness, not in our strengths. Yet we considered him stricken by God, struck down and afflicted. 
The first way that Jesus relates to the church at Smyrna that's undergoing extreme persecution is in their afflictions. The second way that Jesus relates to the church at Smyrna and to the suffering of this world and to you and I when we are suffering is he says, I was abandoned. He says, I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. And here's what was going on in Smyrna in that day and time. Smyrna had been part of a, of a small empire, if you want to call it that, in, in the Lydian Empire. And when they split and rebelled from the Lydians, they needed help. They needed some, some military power to protect them. So they turned to Rome and they said, we'd like to be a protectorate of Rome. And, and they began to have Roma worship, worship of the Roman emperors. And, uh, and there was an exemption, though, for the Jews. Those who had been Jews before they had Roman worship and worship of the emperors, the, the, the Jews were exempt because the Romans knew they were monotheists. And the Jewish population was prominent enough, they didn't want to upset the apple cart. So Rome said, we'll give you an exemption. You're going to be monotheist, but just don't spread it and don't talk about it. Just be who you are and maintain the peace. Well, along came Christianity, and Christians were part of Judaism in that day and time. They were just Jews who said, we know who Messiah is, right? And so here the Jews are of Smyrna, and they're saying, we believe Jesus was the promised Messiah. Well, the Romans and the people of Smyrna knew about the history and the credentials and the history and, and issues of, of Christianity. And they said they didn't want to have anything to do with that. So when Christianity infiltrated and sprung up, at, if you will, not infiltrated, but sprung up out of the Jewish culture that was at Smyrna, the Romans said, uh-uh, we told you, we don't want to have anything to do with this. And so they said, the way to eradicate it is if you point out and rat out and tell on the fellow Jews who have become Christians. And so the Jewish community in Smyrna turned on their own people, on their own families, and on their neighbors, and on their friends, so that they could preserve themselves. And so what happened was you had those who were spiritually, they may have been by heritage Jews, but they missed the boat. They didn't recognize Jesus. And Jesus says, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue or the gathering of Satan. And, and so Jesus is saying, I can understand and I want to relate to you in your afflictions and in your abandonment because I know what it's like to be abandoned. He said, basically, they, the, the Jews had sold their souls for their protection and their price was emperor worship. And the Jews of Smyrna had this exemption because of their emperor worship. And when Christianity came to Smyrna, it, it was that Jewish subset. And they claimed that they, people, they, they were claiming they had found Messiah. So in, in exchange for this leniency and this protection, the Jews could turn in their fellow Christians or their fellow Jews who, were, who had become Christians. And they were often their kinfolk and their neighbors. And, uh, and so they're being persecuted and they're being ratted out by their family and friends. Kind of sounds a little bit like Holy Week, doesn't it? Remember what happened on Palm Sunday? Crowds were crying out, what? Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And by Thursday night and Friday morning, early hours of Friday morning, they were calling for his crucifixion. Jesus says, I know what it's like to be slandered, to be loved on Palm Sunday and crucified on Friday. And I don't know where you are with this. If, if there's an instance or a, a relationship in your life where, where someone, that your faith has become offensive to them and, and that they would turn their back on you because of that. But Jesus wants to relate to you in your abandonment. The third thing that we see, the way that Jesus relates. Let's see if we're going to pass that one up. I need to, there we are. He was afflicted 
as they were afflicted. He was abandoned and he knew them in their abandonment and he was attacked. And he said, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. He dictates to the church at Smyrna, I tell you the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for basically a short period of time. I want to tell you, he says, that I can relate to you when you're attacked. I, th I think of the scripture that comes from 2 Corinthians 4 when Paul writes these words. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. For we preach Christ and not ourselves. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Somebody said we're all kind of cracked pots, but, but we, have, we carry this gospel treasure in jars of clay, Paul says, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, and we don't know anything about this kind of persecution, but there may be some way that you can relate and understand that the acrimony that you may face as a Christian, and, and if not now, it may come. He said, we are not crushed, we are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that in his life, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe because we also believe because we know that the one who raised Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus. And listen to his concluding words. He writes to the church at Corinth because they were undergoing this kind of struggle and you may one day. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Jesus says you're going to be attacked. You're going to face the attacks of the devil. Don't be discouraged. Do not be afraid. Fear not. You know, the opposite of fear is not courage. The opposite of fear is faith. To hold on to the faith. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. So Jesus relates to them. He reminds them of who he is. He relates to them, and then finally, Jesus promises a reward. He says, be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let him hear the one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. One more story out of China that I wanted to share with you, and then I want to share a brief video with you and perhaps give a word about how we can support those who are in this world today who are truly being persecuted. So there was, uh, as recent as 1977, this persecution continues to go on in mainland China. And uh, in 1977, there were two Chinese Christian young ladies and, um, and their pastor, and they were caught by the Chinese government for engaging in Christian activities, which was illegal. And, uh, and they brought the three of them in, and uh, they questioned them, they, they forced them, uh, they tortured them, they, they were trying to force them to uh, renounce their faith and... and renounce Christ and uh, and the two little girls would not and they separated them and the two little girls would not and they said so you will die and they brought them into a courtyard and they tied their hands behind their back and put them up against the wall and they were going to execute them little to their just beyond their understanding their executioner walked into the courtyard with a pistol in his hand and it was their pastor and the Chinese had told them told him if he would renounce his faith 
and be the executioner of these two young students that he had led to Christ, he could go free. And he walked up to them. And I wanted to share with you what they told him as he came to them. They gave him this choice. You renounce your faith or die. And the girls chose to not renounce their faith, but their executioner, when he approached them, they were shocked. It was their pastor. He was sentenced to die with the girls. His inquisitors offered him freedom in exchange for shooting the girls. Not only did he accept their offer, but he rationalized as he came to the girls and he said, why should all three of us die? If I kill you, they will let me live. Then I can continue to do my work among the churches. Mind boggling. The girls bowed their heads and one of them said this, listen, before you shoot us, we want to thank you heartily for what you have meant to us. You led us to Christ and you gave us Holy Communion with the same hands that you now hold the gun. You taught us that Christians are sometimes weak and commit terrible sins, but they can be forgiven again. When you regret what you are about to do to us, do not despair like Judas, but repent like Peter. God bless you, they said. And remember that our last thought was not one of indignation against your failure. Everyone passes through hours of darkness. May God reward you for all the good you have done to us. We die with gratitude. They gave their lives for Christ and they gave their heart. I believe that we can support those who are beyond our walls, especially who are experiencing persecution today, and it is rampant, it is widespread. Uh, we have not ever experienced anything, and we may never experience anything like there is in the world today. But I'd like to show this video, if you're interested in ways that you can, tangible ways that you can support a church in the world that is being persecuted, um, then uh, let's talk after the service or you reach out to me and we'll connect on that. Can we show the video? My name is Jeanette. I am a Christian and I love Jesus with all my heart. I love my children and I love the people of my country, the Central African Republic. There are both Christians and Muslims in my country and we lived as neighbors as I worked to reach them for Christ. But my hope for a peaceful life didn't last. Our village was ambushed by the Islamist attackers. Guns started firing and we started running as fast as we could into the bush. All the Christians in my village were killed or driven into hiding. I fled with my children. We didn't even have time to put on our shoes or clothes. Attacks like these have been targeting Christians in the Central African Republic for eight years and continue today. Churches and missionary stations that have been built over decades have been destroyed along with Christians' homes that have been burnt to the ground. In one area, the only structures that remained were the metal roofs of two churches. Thousands of Christians have spent years in makeshift temporary shelters far from their homes as the violence and instability continues. Delivering desperately needed help to displaced Christians often means overcoming impassable roads using cargo planes, trucks, motorcycles, bicycles, and even canoes. With God's help, supplies are making it to Christians scattered throughout various camps. Today, Jeanette and more than 30,000 Christians in the Central African Republic have been driven from their homes, all because of their faithfulness in maintaining a witness for Christ in majority Muslim areas. 
in the face of severe Islamist violence. These courageous believers, our Christian brothers and sisters in the Central African Republic, have shown God's love and forgiveness to their persecutors. They continue to faithfully follow the Lord and trust Him to meet their needs. that we can support the persecuted church in the world. The Voice of the Martyrs is one of the long-standing uh, and one of the most prominent um, ministries in the world today, but there are many others. If you want to know more, want to plug in in some way, uh, the, the things that we do, and they're tangible ways like donating $10 or a cost of a meal for us, a sandwich, can, can mean so much, but not just materially, but it means that they know. They, it, it, it means that that, that there's someone that cares and that they're connected to the worldwide church and they're not abandoned. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes if we will. Heavenly Father, you've placed resources in our hands. You've given us an awareness of the needs of Christians around the world today, what it was like in Jesus' time for, for people to suffer, things that we can't even fathom, that we can't relate to, but you can relate to, Lord, and it's on your heart and the things that, that are on your heart that break your heart, when they touch our hearts, they should break our hearts. And our world is a broken and dying place. We want to invest and we want to trust that our resources that you've granted us with and that you've placed in our hands have an effect and an impact for eternity so that we come alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ, wherever they might be, whoever they might be, whatever they might be going through, and that you direct us and you guide us. And we take this as a moment in our lives where you have opened our eyes, now we pray that our hearts would be open to you, to the movement of your spirit. We lift one another up to you. We lift the hurting of this world in our community, in our congregation, and to the ends of the earth before you. And this we ask in the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is, My, help, hope, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I'd like for us to stand. I know we're still wearing the masks and everything, but we just sing better when we're standing. Let's stand and sing the first and last verses of My Hope is Built. There are faith promise cards in the foyer. You can find them on the entryway table uh, near the office. 
And if you fill one of those out, you can slide it under the, uh, the church office door, put it in one of the offering baskets. Also, if you're interested in taking part in the third option conversations, it will begin uh, and small group study will begin March the 10th at seven o'clock. Please uh, call the church office or speak to me and we'll get your email address and get you lined up for that. Remember, God loves you. We love you. Stay the course. Thank you.